Good to see everybody here this morning. I was just sitting here, and I saw Kathy Siebert come up. Don't. What says here stays here, by the way. Okay? <laughs> but anyways, I was sitting here, and I saw Kathy Siebert. Did you see I see her this morning? Yes. She fell down Friday. Oh, my gosh. Broke her hand, arm, in two places. And so keep her in your prayers this week. Siffer. Oh, Kathy Siffer. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I only know people's first names. <laughs> I don't even know their first names. So keep her in your prayers. I also want to keep Amanda in her prayers as she continues to look for an apartment. So keep her in your prayers. Amanda? Me. Next door to you. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> keep Norma in your prayers. <laughs> yeah. I need prayers every day, all the time. I really enjoyed the message this morning. Um, anytime we talk about prayer, it's so important because prayer shapes us. Prayer is not just a prayer to uh, a memo to God, it's much more than that. And how it shapes our attitudes, how it shapes our personality, how it shapes our service. And I was thinking just this morning, uh, as, sermon was, as Curtis was preaching, a thought that I had, uh, back in my, uh, one of my former congregations, I had a teenager come up to me after the sermon, and she said, you know, Doug, I really appreciate what you preach and teach, and, but you know, sometimes I don't get everything you mean. And I told her, I said, you don't really have to. It's not how much we know. It's not how much we do. It's about how much our heart seeks after Christ. Sometimes it's not how much, I mean, it's not how much you hear. You don't hear. Yes. What? <laughs> but anyways, I just wanted to say that, because sometimes we, we think of religion as, so I have to do something. I have to learn something. I have to do, and it's not that's the case. It's your heart that goes after Christ. And when your heart goes after Christ, you're going to learn things. And you're going to do things because your heart is in the right place. And God judges us by our heart. He doesn't judge us by how much we have on our brain or how much work we do with our hands. So uh, as we begin, let's go ahead and uh, begin in a word of prayer. Our most holy, gracious Father God, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts that you're a God who hears our prayers and you act. And I know that sometimes you don't act as quick as we would like you to. But Lord, we thank you for this avenue of prayer. And I ask you to be with each of us this morning as each of us struggle with challenges in our life. That you give us strength and you give us courage to meet those challenges on a daily basis and to learn to trust you more and more in our hearts. Praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if there's any boxes left. By the way, I found out you have to take these boxes home. Okay? I got ours, Jerry. Okay, I got, I got a really nice one. It's, it's silver <coughs> with deer on it. So it's pretty nice. Pretty nice. So when I go out here, if you guys haven't got a box, get one. Because when I go home, I want to make sure all the boxes are gone. Okay? There will not be class next week, Thanksgiving Sunday. So uh, we won't have class next week. And uh, we've got just a few more weeks left in December. Um, in December? In December. In November. Well, no, November's over with. Not quite. <laughs> we'll be the next time we meet. It'll be December. So uh, just a few more weeks left. And we'll start a new series uh, come January. Uh, we'll be finished up with John, uh, the first section of John, the first 12 chapters. Uh, and then we're going to take a break. Uh, there'll be another class in here. And then we'll come back to the latter part of John uh, later on. Um, but I wanted to get in this first section of John. The first 12 chapters are very important because it sets the stage for what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Now, those of you who were last, last week, we're talking about John chapter 11, which is the resurrection uh, 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 of Lazarus. And uh, I used to think it was the resuscitation of Lazarus. 
But after my study this week, I'm beginning to think, no, this is a resurrection story. Even though it's not a complete resurrection, as in Jesus' resurrection, it's still a resurrection story because John is, I mean, Zet Lazarus is dead. He's beyond the point of no return. There's no possibility of recitation. John makes us very clear of that. And so we begin, uh, we turned, took a look at the first part of the chapter 11, which was his conversation with Martha. And I just want to kind of highlight some of the things for those of you who weren't here last week. Now, as you know, uh, Jesus had to retreat to the place in, where he was baptized uh, because of the f- people were trying to kill him. And so he needed a safe place to go. But he also needed a place to go to consecrate himself. But what about is going to happen? It's the last part of his life. He's only going to make one more trip to Jerusalem. That's it. And so he has to consecrate himself. This is a very important lesson for us. As much as it was for Jesus, as much as it was for the people, as they got ready under Joshua to go into the promised land, they had to consecrate themselves, dedicate themselves to God. (laughs) I'm speaking from my larynx and not my, my lungs. Okay. They have to consecrate themselves. They have to dedicate themselves to God. They have to get rid of all their sin. They have to say, okay, God, this is it. I'm going to trust you. Uh, And basically, we need to do the same thing. Whenever we begin a new ministry, whenever we begin a new set of lives, it's good for us to take time and to dedicate ourselves again, to remind ourselves to trust God and uh, what he's going to do for us. And that takes a time of consecration. That's all consecration is. So Jesus is there. He gets word. uh, And now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, Martha, and her sister. It was Mary who anointed Jesus with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. We're going to see that later on in 12. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, "This this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. Stop. I said we need to stop and see. This story is about not just the resurrection of Lazarus. The resurrection of Lazarus is a tool upon which God is glorified. All right? So the question is, how is God going to be glorified in this story? And how does this lead to Jesus' glorification? Which is very important for us. Uh, and I told you, and I tell you all the time whenever I see this word glory, that 99% of the time when you see the word glory, you're talking about the honor of God. Not just that he's bright and he's blinding, okay, uh, great light. It means his honor. And so what's going to be displayed in this resurrection of Lazarus is the honor of God. And this honor of God is going to honor Jesus Christ, his son. And so those are the things we want to look at. Now, what does that mean for us? And let me see about going the wrong way. There we go. Uh, we go back to chapter 10. And I told you, this is the key verse to understand what's coming up next. Jesus says to them, I give them eternal life. No one, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and one is able to snatch them. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. That is God's honor. That is Jesus' honor to us. And I talked about this last week, that you are in the hands of God, and there is nothing, no one, that can snatch you out of that. And so the story in 11 is all about Is this true, Jesus? The story, is this true? Is this story true, Jesus, that uh, it's true that I, your child, nothing can snatch me out of here? What about this or what about that? And so uh, that's what we know. So anyways, uh, Jesus gets the word that Lazarus is sick. Now, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he meant rest and sleep. Uh, one of the euphemisms in the Old Testament is uh, sleep meant death. Okay? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you No. And I know that we'd like to talk about that. When we die, we go to sleep. Oh, no. All right? It's used to say death. They thought he was saying he was just sick. 
Then Jesus told them plainly. Sometimes Jesus has to tell us things plainly. Because sometimes we don't get it. Sort of like the parable. Sometimes we just kind of don't really kind of grasp it. And so he has to tell us plainly. Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Believe what? I talked about last week. What is it that they're supposed to believe? Because they already believe Jesus is the Christ. And they already believe that he's the son of God. And we're going to see that belief carry on uh, with the sisters. But Jesus is saying something else about believing. And I think it goes back to this idea of the honor of God. The promise that Jesus made. That is a promise, by the way, that Jesus made. That nothing, once God has hold of you, there is nothing that can snatch you out of God's hands. Nothing. That's a promise that we stand on. Uh, uh, but he says, let us go there. So Thomas, the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Interesting statement that Thomas makes. And Thomas will come up later on uh, in, uh, I think it's 20, uh, chapter 20. So Martha goes out. Here's Jesus talk to him. Martha goes out and talks to him. Lord, if you'd been here, uh, 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 he would have loved. Remember that statement. Uh, very important. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay, stop right there. What does it mean, I am the resurrection and the life? What does that mean to us? What does it mean to them? What is John trying to tell his church? What is the gospel trying to tell us today? That I am the resurrection and the life. And how does that glorify God? Ah, see how the mind works? All right, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? All right, and what is the response? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Bingo. You need, to write, you need to underline this. You need to put a star by this. You need to write this on a card and keep this. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Not who came into the world. Not, not who came into the world. But one who is continually coming into the world. It's one of those verbs that means not just in a point of time, but a continual coming into the world. So John is trying to teach his church. Jesus is still coming into the world. He's trying to teach, and the gospel is trying to tell us today, Jesus is still coming into the world. All right? Uh, although we may not see him and touch him, he is still coming into the world. How does he still come into the world? Through the Holy Spirit? How else? Through our faith, through our belief. All right, he's still coming into the world. He still has his presence here. Other than his purpose is eternal, is what that says. Yes, it is. His presence is eternal. Um, that's what marks us different from all the other religions in the world. Paul will tell us that the church is made up of individual Christians put together, built as a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. When we gather in the worship center, I call, I'm sorry, I don't call it an auditorium. Because when we call it an auditorium, we strip God out of it. It's a worship hall, worship center. It's where we worship God. And when we come together, the Holy Spirit is there. When two or more people are there, the Holy Spirit is there. And we need to understand that. that we are of the presence of God. Whenever we gather together, the presence of God is right here with us today. Understand that. It's so important for us to understand that we are not alone. And that we can't do anything by ourselves. It's the Spirit who is there. I am the resurrection and life. Do you believe this? And so that's where we ended last week. Now we've got to see where Martha is. Mary. Mary is in the, uh, in, in the house. Martha ran out to the outside of the village to get to Jesus. All right. 
Uh, so when she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, most likely she didn't want to whisper in her ear, most likely Mary was in a private place. She was probably in the house. And so the reason she didn't go to Jesus is because she didn't know he was there. All right? He kind of explains that to us. The teacher is here and is calling for you. The teacher is here. The teacher is, it's not that she doesn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. It's just their way of talking about him. They called him the teacher. That was just, just like you, you call me Doug. All right? Hey, Doug, what you doing today? Hey, Doug, you know? Or, uh, or minister. I had a friend who called me, um, he started calling me Pastor Doug, and some people got on his case because we don't have pastors. Well, we do have pastors. They're called elders. Uh, uh, and so he said, oh, Doug, I'm sorry. He was a new Christian. He said, Doug, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> but I want to call you something um, because I honor the office. I don't, it's not about you, but it's about the office that you have. And so I call him, well, call me Preacher Doug. And so from this day, he still calls me Preacher Doug. And uh, he said something very interesting, uh, the fact that we honor people. And so this, when she calls him teacher, she's honoring him, all right, is here and calling for you. So he wants Mary to come to him. He doesn't go to Mary. But he calls Mary to him. What do you think that says to the people of John's church? What do you think it says to us? We're invited. That's right. We are invited to come to him. Even though he's not here physically, he invites us to his presence. And we have to get up and go to his presence. You know? Uh, just like we have to get up and go to church. Or we have to get up and go do something, go to work. Or we have to get up and go do something. Uh, we just don't sit at home. Same thing with our faith. We are invited to come to him. And he calls our name. Don't ever think that Jesus does not know you personally. He does. He knows you by name. And just like he said, Mary, come to me. He says... Jeff, come to me. Gwen, come to me. Bev, come to me. Amanda, come to me. He says those. He knows us by name. He knows our hearts. And he doesn't care about <coughs> the bad things we've done. And he doesn't care about that bad part in our heart. That is the one message that I wish we could all give to one another. God, Jesus only sees the good in you. He only sees the potential in you. And he wants you to be the best you can be. I hate using those, those little terms, you know, that commercials use. But sometimes they're right. And so he wants the best of you. All right? <clears throat> he doesn't care about that bad spot in your heart. He's going to fix that. You know, uh, Curtis may not be a mechanic, but Jesus is. All right, Jesus is a mechanic. He knows what's some part of your heart, and he's going to fix it. And so he knows that is not what defines you. Paul tells us that. I don't do the things I know I should do, and when I do the things I'm supposed to do, evil comes into my life. Oh, wretched man, who, who, how shall I deal with God? I'm paraphrasing. Thanks be to God who through Christ makes me right. Even though I do what is wrong, my mind is set to do God's will. And Jesus understands that. That doesn't mean we don't have to say we're sorry. That doesn't mean we have to confess our sins. We do. But that is not what defines us. I don't remember exactly where he is, but in... in uh, in the older translation, the word propitiation shows up. And uh, that word confused me. And basically, 
as I studied, it seemed to me that it simply was, he took my place. Um, there is, I, I'm glad you said that because I don't think there's many people who understand propitiation because it's only used a couple times in the New Testament. Um, we don't understand whether it's propitiation or expiation. All right, it could be either one. Okay. They're kind of a little bit different. Okay. Um, Paul doesn't tell us how Jesus forgives our sins. He just says he does. Now, we put things in there from some certain scriptures we use, and we come to this idea, well, he paid our price, paid the debt. It's okay. Or it's a cosmic battle, and God wins the cosmic battle. Or it's an uh, appropriation or appreciation of God. We don't know how. Paul never explains it. Jesus never explains it. He just says it does. Our scientific mind can't get around that. We want to know why. I was watching a, uh, a documentary on the Revolutionary War, and uh, one of the things at Valley Forge was this, this uh, general from uh, Prussia came over to train the troops, and he couldn't speak English, and so he had to learn. But he said something very interesting. He says, in my country, when an officer tells you to do something, you do it. But he says, in America, you have to explain why they have to do it. And that's what he did. He explained why they had to do certain things. And he said, once they understand that, they'll do it. And I think that's part of our science that's, that's in our DNA as Americans. It has to do with our hearts. Well, it has to do with our hearts. We want to change, to follow change. I think you're right. I think that our heart is part of that. And people, people call ministers pastors. Everybody calls them pastors. But they've tried to change them. But that's, they're not... Pastors are, and according to the Bible, are elders, right? Or does it make any difference, the title? In the Bible, they're called elders. They're called bishops. They're called presbyters. Um, we're all deacons, right? No, not we're all deacons, no. We're all servants. servants. We're not all deacons mm -hmm. or deaconesses. Um, but that's another story. Um, another, day. another day. But you're right. Uh, how we name things, a pastor is one who cares about someone and helps someone do something. Elders are spiritual pastors. So preachers can be pastors. Preachers can be pastors. It's not, uh, not so much in our faith belief because Churches of Christ don't see it that way. All right? They see the office of preacher and elder as two different entities. All right? In many of the Protestant churches, that's not so. The elder and the preacher are one and the same. You have a senior pastor and junior pastors, or whatever. Um, so that's what that is. That's why some people call pastors. I don't care what the title says. Title doesn't define you. You know, if you want to call me Pastor Doug, that's fine. Yeah, just don't call me Almighty Doug, okay? Or Your Holiness. Or Your Holiness. Don't call me Your Holiness. My we Holiness do Doug. That, Doug. Okay? We do that? Good. You know? We might call Jerry that. Yeah. She is my pastor. All right. She went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, when Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him, she is going outside the village. And you can imagine in your mind, is she kind of dawdling her way out there? Kind of taking her time, picking a few flowers, talking to people along the way. Hey, how are you doing, Martha? I'm doing just fine. No, no she's going directly. To Jesus. Now the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise and quickly and go out, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So even the people in the house did not know Jesus was there. All right. So this is private meetings with Martha, private meetings uh, with Mary. Now when Mary came to Jesus. 
where Jesus was in Psalm, she fell at his feet. That is a meaning of a position of worship. All right. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, when they talk about someone falling at their feet to somebody, it's in a position of worship. She's on the ground, flat on the ground in front of him. She's worshiping him. It's a position of worship. So she understands who he is. It's not like, oh, you know, it's been so long since I've seen you. You know, no, it's worship. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing Martha said, remember? Were they a little angry at him because he hadn't come? No, I don't think so. I think they're just, they're just, no, I think they just, if only you were here earlier, you know, my brother would have been alive. I just, I think he's just out of grief, just explaining how they feel, you know. If you'd been here, I don't think there's anything derogatory toward that. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come with her, also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. What does your version say in that verse? Says angry. Says angry. Says he was. He wept. He was. He was angry. What verse? <laughs> Where am I at? Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Deeply troubled. You have deeply troubled. He, when he saw her weeping and others weeping and wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. I like that verse. He was deeply troubled. Deeply moved. A lot of vibes. A lot of versions don't really want to put the real word in here. She has the real word. Deeply angry. He is very indignant. He's not sorrowful. He's not sympathetic. The Greek word is deeply angered. Why would Jesus be angered? Because they didn't understand what he was trying to do. Some people think because they didn't understand. Some people think it's because they didn't have faith. But think about, why is Jesus angry? I made a note that says he's angry at Satan and death. Yes. This was not intended by God. This is a product of the fall. God never intended death. He never intended sorrow. He never intended disease. He never intended uh, unemployment. He never intended... Prejudice. He never intended those things. That is all a product of our world and a product of our sin. Jesus is angry that we have to suffer that. That's how much he loves us. He's angry. He's not just, oh, well, you know, Norma's sick. No, so well. You know, she'll get by it. No, he's angry that Norma's not well. Oh, good. <laughs> Makes me feel better. You know, he's angry. He's angered, which is very important to the Gospel of John because, again, I tell you, he reaches back into the Old Testament. Where's he reaching back to with that statement? The garden. The garden. With what statement? Right there. It was anger. Reaching back to the garden to bring it out. And that's going to come out more as we talk about this resurrection. And nothing we have to remember when we talk about the glory of Christ, it's about the garden. Okay? This Lord, is if. All new to them. Oh, yeah. To oh, yeah. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He was angry. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. What does Jesus do? There you go. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. That's the one thing we should always know and memorize. He wept. Jesus wept. Wept. God is a God of emotion. I don't know why we spent a hundred years trying to dig that out of us. God created us to be emotional. Not that the emotions control us. But we're emotional beings in the image of God. God is an emotional God. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But suddenly said, 
Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Again, we see this double idea in John. There are some who agree, some who don't. Remember, that's one of the things John is dealing with with his gospel, that yes, there are those who believe, but yes, there are those who don't believe. Right? So again, we see this double type of faith and unfaith, faith and unbelief. Then Jesus moved again. Wow. Again, that anger comes out. Uh, came to the tomb. It was cave, and a stone lay against it. Does that give you an image of something? All right? Give you an image of something? All right? Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. What did Martha say when Jesus said, I am the resurrection life, and, I, and do you believe it? What did she say? Yeah, she believed that, but it was the final resurrection. No, nope, she believed that he is the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. But she, doesn't, she didn't connect that with the resurrection yet. All right? She didn't connect that yet. So she believed that. But here John points something out that is very important to his church and very important to us. Sometimes we don't get the whole picture. Sometimes we don't understand everything. And I hate to tell you this, but that's okay. It's okay. That doesn't mean that you don't have enough smarts. It doesn't mean you don't have enough knowledge. That doesn't mean you have no decision. Just it's not in your worldview. I don't know about you, but resurrection is, is not really something we see every day. Something we have to believe in. And he said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You would see the glory of God. What are we going to see, Jesus. So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He's out loud with this, by the way. I know that you always hear me. Oops, I'm sorry. <sighs> Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. Why is that important statement in there? Because that's what Mar Martha said when she first met Jesus. We know that God hears you and does whatever you ask him to do. He's talking to Martha by using those words. Even though he's talking to everybody else, his attention is to Martha. Why to Martha? So that she would believe. So even though he's talking to everybody, he's zeroing in on Martha. He cares about each and every single one of us. It's individual. His care is individual. He's just not caring for his people. He's caring, and while he's speaking to the people, he's speaking to you. When Curtis speaks the word of God every Sunday morning, Even though it sounds like a, a shotgun approach, that spirit is taking it and putting it in someone's heart because someone needs to hear that message. And even though we don't hear it, someone else might. And so we need to pay attention. Whenever God's word is preached or taught, pay attention because something how, somehow is reaching you. Why do we struggle right there, Doug? I, because it's so commonplace, Bill, to come every week. Well, and I think, you know, this when, when Jesus is making this argument that, or, you know, to, to Mary that you know that I hear, or you know that God hears, we expect God to hear and to answer the way we want to answer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It doesn't answer the way that we wanted answered in our situation, even though he did answer in the way you wanted it in your situation, why didn't he answer me right? Yeah. 
why didn't you answer me the way I wanted to answer? So we struggle there. I think we do. I think we do. Uh, God has God has always heard my voice and always answered my prayers. There has not been a prayer God has not answered in my life. Always. It may not have been exactly what I wanted. Uh, you know, I prayed for a, a, a BMW conver a convertible. Larry gave me one. Hot Wheel. We think that he's going to answer us right away. It's in God's time. Not our time, and sometimes we forget that. We think, oh, he didn't answer me the way I wanted. Well, you know, maybe it's not that time yet. It could be. And I know we like to take a sermon like today and kind of qualify it. We don't, you know. Um, and I, I want to be very careful about this because it's sometimes we try to qualify God's Jesus' statements about prayer. Why does God take his time to do things? Why does God take his time to do things in his time? Because he works through people. He doesn't have a magic wand and say, Doug, here's your BMW. Yep. He tells Larry, Larry, go get him a hot car, Hot Wheels convertible. <laughs> I got my convertible, didn't I? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. There we go. So. God works through people. That's why it takes him time. That's why World War II took so much time. He had to work through people. Yep. He works through people. He gets things going. He gets things in line. He is a God of, uh, of organization. Being specific. And we didn't get to the end of the story. I thank you. I said this on account of people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. That is the work of Christ. That is our work, to get people to believe that Jesus has been sent by God. Why is that important? Why is that the glory of God, knowing that God sent Jesus into the world? And it goes right back to the garden. What did, Jesus, what did God say to the snake or the serpent? He will what? Crush your head and you will what? God is going to answer that promise. That's the glory of God. That's the honor of God who fulfills his promise. This is the beginning of the end. It's not the beginning. It's not the end. But it's the beginning of the end. God is the answer. That's the glory of God. That's the honor of God. He's going to rescue us. How many centuries did that take from the time he promised that? So anyways, we'll pick up this in two weeks. Go back. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I'll let your mind think about what that looked like. Being wrapped up with a cloth on his face. What do you think that looked like? Mummy. The mummy. And how did that mummy come out? Did he kind of tiptoe out? Did someone take a, 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 a dolly and kind of put him there and, and throw him out? Did he have skates on? No. So in your mind, imagine what that looked like. And that's end of today. That's where we'll end. And in two weeks, we'll pick up on this. All right, let's end with a word of prayer. Oh, most holy, gracious Father, God, we thank you so much that you are God who listens to our prayers. But sometimes we need to have a little courage and strength and persistence. Forgive us of that. We know that you care about us. Lord Jesus, we know that you care about us individually. You care about how we are facing life and the struggles we face. And we are thankful Jesus, that you walk with us. Forgive us of our sins. And we are so, so thankful for all that you've done for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't got a box, get one.